Coming up, meet some extraordinary native people, from an advocate actress to the legendary man who developed the Cherokee syllabary, and even an elite marathon runner. I'm Aliyah Chavez. Join us for those interviews, plus headlines from Indian Country today. Arizona State University welcomes 3,500 indigenous students from Arizona and across the nation. It serves one of the largest populations of indigenous students among U.S. colleges and universities. We created a sense of place for tribal nations to create futures of their own making through community outreach and research, taught by world-class indigenous faculty where they see a reflection of themselves and their experiences. Find community at ASU. is Indian Country Today. Amirawa Hopa, thank you for joining us. I'm Aliyah Chavez. Developments in Washington, D.C. as demonstrators are putting more pressure on President Joe Biden and Interior Secretary Deb Holland to take aggressive climate action and halt fossil fuel projects. On Thursday, land and water protectors occupied the lobby of the Department of Interior Videos show approximately 40 protesters who formed a circle in the lobby before being taken into custody by the Department of Homeland Security. Outside the sit-in, hundreds of supporters held a rally. The Department of Interior houses both the Bureau of Indian Affairs and Education, and it was the 1970s, rather, when indigenous people last occupied this building. The Occupation Thursday is the latest move in a series of events that started on Indigenous Peoples Day. More than 300 indigenous people and climate activists have been arrested separately at the White House this week. As of Thursday, the Biden administration has not commented on the mass civil disobedience or responded to the demonstrators' demands. A new leader to help lead the nation's largest and oldest native organization in the country. Mark Macaro was elected as first vice president of the National Congress of American Indians on Thursday. He is the chairman of the Pechanga Band of Luis Sueño Indians. Macaro received over 51% of the vote, beating out two other candidates for the position. Fawn Sharp was elected to a second term as president of NCAI, and she ran unopposed. NCAI's annual convention was held virtually for a second year in a row. Shortly after elections Thursday, the executive board was sworn into office and will serve a two-year term. The University of Hawaii is asking for input on how to use the sacred land Mauna Kea over the next 20 years. Mauna Kea is located on the big island of Hawaii. It was the focus of a 2019 controversy when construction of a 30-meter telescope was slated to begin. Many Native Hawaiians opposed this project, saying they did not want the telescope to be built because Mauna Kea is a sacred place to them. It is their place of origin. The mountain is already home to 13 telescopes because scientists say the mountain's minimal air pollution is the ideal place to study the cosmos. Currently, the university is asking for the public's input on the mountain's master plan. The previous plan had a 20-year lifespan and is now time to be updated. The master plan will include how the land is used from parking areas to astronomy facilities. Hawaiians are able to submit comments online through the mail or a phone call with the deadline of October 26th. Indigenous people took to Paraguay to advocate for land rights. Hundreds of indigenous people peacefully protested at the nation's capital on Tuesday, demanding the return of colonized land. The protest comes after weeks of passing a law that punishes land invasions with criminal charges. It also marks the start of the Spanish colonization of the Americas. Mario Rivarola is a member of the Indigenous Network for a Dignified Life. He says the day is a reminder of the violence and displacement. Painfully, we know this day as the day of the indigenous, of the race, but we have also endured violations to our rights in our communities, violations and evictions. 
The law affects several indigenous communities who currently live in settlements while they wait for their land to be given back. A Cherokee author is finding their voice while creating award-winning children's books. Art Colson is a Cherokee Nation descendant who worked for 25 years in writing and editing before finding his voice as a children's author. His 2020 release, The Reluctant Storyteller, has now been named one of the best children's books in 2020 by the prestigious book committee, Bank Street. It tells the story of teenager Chooch Tenkiller, who is reluctant to be a storyteller like the rest of his family. Instead, he wants to be a chef. In just the last year, while working full-time for the Minnesota Department of Human Services, Colson has written seven new titles. He now has 10 works for children and youth, including four books in a series on hunting and fishing, plus two graphic novels and a play. And those are the headlines for Indian Country Today. I'm Alia Chavez. Coming up, it's a great day to be Indigenous. We're introducing some extraordinary individuals who are making history. This is Indian Country Today. Ashley Collingwell is a model, an actress, and an advocate. She has appeared in numerous television shows, including Blackstone, and on the fourth season of The Amazing Race Canada. Ashley became the first Indigenous woman to win the title of Mrs. Universe in 2015. She's also a social media influencer with over 1 million Instagram followers. Mark Trahan interviewed her about her latest projects. I'm an ambassador for different organizations like Nike, so I do a lot of partnerships with them for RW and Co, Dress for Success, and a lot of different Indigenous initiatives. So I'm full-time doing that, but just recently, it's going to be coming out on October 21st on my birthday. I am on the second season of Tribal, which is a crime series based here in Canada. So I'm super pumped for that to come out. Bethany Yellowtail is a leading Indigenous designer. Tell us about your partnership. Uh, I love Bethany. Anytime she sends me any of her designs, I proudly wear them because not only are they Indigenous owned and everything that she stands for is just so powerful. I feel that whenever I collaborate with her, whenever I've met her, I just feel empowered. It's just one of those designs and one of those things that women create where you feel like you can take your culture with you anywhere that you go. So upcoming, I'll be actually doing a partnership with her. So you'll have to stay tuned for a new collection. Ashley gives voice to many different issues facing Indigenous people. It's always important to be outspoken and speak my truth. And especially if I'm in a position where I have a platform, where I'm considered an ambassador, where I can actually use my voice, it's important for me to use it as much as possible because so many of our voices are silenced. I speak about so many issues like murdered or missing Indigenous women, our children who are in the foster care system, the environment, politics. So I talk about a lot of things, but it's so important for me to use this time because that's the last thing I want is our voices to go silent. And with the industry that I'm in, whether it be modeling, pageantry or acting, um, they're all happy that I use my voice and I use these opportunities to create more opportunities for other people as well. So whenever I got that chance to speak up, I use it. It's crazy because I went from being this little insecure girl on the reserve that never wanted to use my voice to now being this international motivational speaker. So for me, it's all about inspiring change and letting others know that you can do these things as well. We're seeing more Indigenous stories hitting mainstream media. How does that influence your plans? I think it's about time that they are featuring, you know, more Indigenous actors, more Indigenous storytelling, because our stories are so beautiful. They need to be told. People need to hear the truth. And it's really impactful. It's impactful because Indigenous representation is so important. You know, as a young girl, I didn't really see many Indigenous um, models or actors. I only saw really a handful. And now you're able to see, you know, such a diverse group of people that have so many talents. And it's wonderful that we're finally being acknowledged. And for me, you know, this opens a lot of doors with representation and which jobs I can actually go for now because, you know, it used to be so limited and now things are being more inclusive. So 
I'm glad that I was able to open the door for someone else, you know, be the first of something. But the most important thing is knowing that I won't be the last. It's always about opening that door of opportunity for someone else. One of the things that you do is talk a lot to young people. What kinds of questions do they have and what are the stories you want to tell them? A lot of them ask me because I grew up in a really difficult situation where I lived through physical and sexual abuse and I lived through poverty and that's a very common story in Indian country. So a lot of youth have asked me, you know, how did I overcome these obstacles of, you know, these stereotypes, being dealing with racism, dealing with the poverty at home and also dealing with my self-confidence. Um, a lot of people asked, how did you turn your life around? How did you finally find happiness? And to me, it's so important to share that, you know, my culture saved my life. My culture kept me on the red road. My culture kept me traditional and it kept me so valued in what I really believe in. And I feel that, you know, my culture is something I keep with me everywhere that I go and it gives me strength. And that's the one thing I always want to encourage the youth is that our culture is our strength. Resiliency runs through our blood. And it's so important no matter where you come from or what obstacles you have to overcome, you can truly become the person that you're meant to be if you have self-love for yourself and you live a fearless life. You never let fear stop you from chasing your dreams. You've been a spokesperson for health and exercise. What does that mean to you? You know, for me, I feel that my physical health really helps my mental health. And I really like to talk to the youth about that because, you know, even if it's just walking, a little bit of movement, it clears your mind. For me, it clears my mind and I feel good. And I feel like I've done something productive. Even if I've done something simple outside, you know, exploring in nature, it's really good for your mental health for you to really kind of debrief from everything else that's going on in your life and have some movement and it feels good to sweat. It is so good for your mental health. And I really encourage the youth to just go outside, get off your phones once in a while. <laughs> Sequoia is famous for developing a unique set of characters known as the Cherokee syllabary. His English name was George Guess and he was born in the 1770s from Tuskegee, Tennessee to Zaragoza, Mexico, a new documentary, Searching for Sequoia, takes viewers on a journey. It retraces Sequoia's final quest, the mystery surrounding his death, and the legacy he left behind. Joining us is Leanne Howe. She's a writer and producer. She's Choctaw and the Edison Distinguished Professor in English at the University of Georgia. And Joshua Nelson, the co-producer and narrator. Nelson is Cherokee and an associate professor at the University of Oklahoma. But first, let's watch the trailer. Sequoia has always been a giant mythic figure in Cherokee history. Sequoia is really the first Cherokee genius. No one person has ever created a writing system in 5,000 years of human civilization. So it was an incredible feat, not only for the Cherokee, but for humanity. He's been mythologized. He's less a person or a man than an icon. Sequoia shows up in the documents far more than many Cherokee people, and yet doesn't show up enough for us to piece them together. It's a really unique contradiction in terms of who the man was versus what his achievements were. He was an artist, he was a soldier, he was a politician, he was a diplomat. From his birth, which no one knows quite the date, to his death, no one quite knows. So his entire life is shot in mystery. People said he was crazy. People said he was doing something that was wrong. Yet here we are, 200 years later, still talking about him. Like much of Sequoia's life, Sequoia's death is heavily mythologized. No one knows exactly where he died. No one's ever found the body. I don't know what will happen when you go to search for Sequoia in Mexico. Would we find his grave? Would we find his descendants? Would we find people who are carrying stories about him? When we search for Sequoia, we search not just for the historical person, but we search for what he came to symbolize. Because in a lot of ways, the search for Sequoia is the search for us. That was a clip from Searching for Sequoia. Professor Howe, tell us about Sequoia. Most people don't know very much about Sequoia, the man and his legacy. Um, if they know anything about him, it's like 
Well, he um, he has a, a tree named for him, <laughs> so um, which is really kind of odd. But um, we we wanted to tell the story of the man who traveled um, from uh, what is the eastern eastern part of the United States around uh, Alabama, and they traveled uh, to Oklahoma and then all the way into Mexico. And so his journey, on his journey, he was looking for Cherokees to reunite with what had then become uh, the, the uh, Cherokee nation. And they asked him to go down to Mexico, to Zaragoza, um, to find other Cherokees and bring them back home into the Cherokee nation. So we were um, intrigued. There has never been a film about Sequoia and his uh, amazing journey, plus the fact that he wrote the syllabary. And that's the first tribal um, language and the characters that he used are all unique to uh, Sequoia. So it's a fabulous story and we hope everyone will, um, will enjoy the film, but also learn something about his life. Professor Nelson related what he learned from making the film. I learned a lot more than I ever uh, expected to. Uh, so, you know, of course we knew that there was plenty to learn about Sequoia, uh, who's just this giant figure um, and a really a kind of a mythic figure. Um, and then, you know, there are these legends that grow up around him. And so to hear um, the accounts of descendants and others tell about the things that they'd heard from their families uh, was, you know, just remarkable. But I guess what I, I learned too, most saliently to me, was, um, you know, it, it kind of comes out of this spirit of exploration that Sequoia had. So, you know, this guy in his 60s, taking off on horseback from Tahlequah, going down to Zaragoza, just kind of blew my mind. And uh, I, I think what I learned along the way there was that um, there's, there's real reward in, in that kind of spirit. Uh, there's just this kind of um, transformational kind of experience that you have, meeting people from all these different sort of places. And as we saw, finding traces of that Cherokee exploration, and, and not just Cherokees, other Southeastern tribes too, all along the way. And so just kind of thinking about, you know, how far our people went uh, back in days when travel wasn't super easy, you know, across Comanche territory and across Texas, when Texas was not at its friendliest, let's just leave it there. Um, it was really inspiring to me. Professor Howe told the meeting of descendants of Sequoia. The most rewarding part of the journey is meeting Sequoia's descendants. And Winnie Purdue, Winnie Guest Purdue, uh, traveled with us to uh, from uh, Tahlequah, as Joshua was talking about, all the way into Zaragoza. And the fact that we uh, find, as Joshua had just said, traces of him was very meaningful to Winnie uh, along the way. It was it was a, a journey of of remembering uh, and were remembering him. And I was struck by the sincerity of the people at Zaragoza to also help us find him. And that was the biggest surprise to me in making this film as we got to Zaragoza, uh, we'd driven all that way uh, as Joshua was talking about through uh, various border crossings and so forth, and to get there. And the first people we meet, of course, is, is the mayor, Leoncino Martinez. And we had a translator with us who was at, told him that we were asking about Sequoia. And he said, oh yes, we know Sequoia. <laughs> I'm, I, could, I could have fallen over because so many people in the United States say, well, we don't know much about him. Or if if they've ever heard of him, it's around the naming of the tree. So um, it, was, it was a revelation that they not only knew him, um, but they also knew 
uh, the stories of what happened to him. Um, it was an amazing journey. People recognized him to be sure. Uh, you know, the Cherokee Nation um, pounded out a medal in his honor. There are all these resolutions. Uh, you know, once the language or the syllabary caught on in the language, people became broadly literate in a big hurry. And so when the Cherokee Phoenix starts coming out on press, people knew about Sequoia locally. Um, and of course, you know, folks over in uh, Washington knew about him too, not least because that newspaper represented a, a unifying force again, um, a, a way of keeping Cherokee people informed of the kinds of problems that they were facing with removal. Um, so yeah, it was, uh, it was a, a brand new weapon in a lot of ways, um, and uh, it, it garnered a lot of attention. Searching for Sequoia comes to PBS stations beginning November 1st. It's also part of the American Indian Film Festival in San Francisco, where anyone will be able to watch it online. When we come back, we meet marathon runner Kyle Samutskuku. Stay with us. The distance between Munkopee, Arizona to Boston, Massachusetts is more than 2,500 miles. And when you're preparing for the Boston Marathon, you might have to run that far in training. When runners lined up for the 125th Boston Marathon on Monday, Kyle Sumutskuku was there. He's Hopi and from the village of Munkopee in northeastern Arizona. He finished 48th in the field of 20,000 runners. He joined me on Wednesday for my first in-person interview in the studio. Take a look. So in the beginning of time, uh, I was running uh, 80 to 90 miles. And then, you know, as um, fitness started to evolve and it will carry on to 100 miles every week. So, you know, um, I have some uh, crucial uh, workouts will be track and then it will be uh, a progression run too as well. And then, of course, you got your recovery runs and then you got, you, ha you have your uh, long, uh, Sunday long runs. So between 18 to 19 miles or 20 miles, give or take, that's it. Wow, that's really far. For me, that's like from my res to the nearest <laughs> Walmart. So <laughs> that's quite a distance. Yeah. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, sort of how you prepared and how you showed up. Um, it sounds like you prepared a lot for this. You trained and, um, you know, worked really hard to make this happen. Um, did you accomplish your goals that you had set out for yourself? Oh, yeah, most definitely. You know, um, from my previous uh, first marathon debut from Shiprock Marathon, uh, my personal first personal best was 238.08. And then, you know, I kind of made a promise and a goal for myself looking at the bigger picture, if I'm going to be racing on the grand stage of Boston Marathon, um, I'm, of course, the roads, the road, the course is going to be hilly and, of course, Heartbreak Hill. You know, I just wanted to set the standard and the bar high for my first Boston Marathon debut. So, you know, it took a lot of preparation. I uh, waited for two years uh, with the whole pandemic, uh, you know, kind of getting in between of me training and getting ready. And then, you know, with the Boston Marathon being postponed until like another year, you know, and um, I just kind of had to keep my, uh, I had to keep myself um, in high spirits and then just continue what uh, I was uh, driv dri like pretty much uh, focusing on wanted to do. And yeah, so I just kept my faith strong and, you know, just kind of roll with the punches and just try to remain uh, optimistic about it. That was Boston Marathon runner Kyle Samutskuku. Now an encore presentation of an interview with Seed Keeper author Diane Wilson. She'll be presenting at Rural Women Everywhere Wednesday, October 20th, hosted by the Center for Rural Strategies. ICT's Shirley Snavy has this report. The Seed Keeper by Diane Wilson shows how generations of women carry on their Dakota culture through the seeds they plant. It's Wilson's third book, but her first novel, all going back to 1862 and the events surrounding the Minnesota Uprising. To tell the story of food and to tell, I had to go back. I had to go there again and tell that story about um, 
the women who protected their seeds. Because there's that traditional way of gardening, there's that traditional diet, there's all of our beautiful uh, food traditions before that. And to me, it's so important to know this is, this is our culture. Fast forward, Rosalie is a farmer. Gabby is an activist who protests against genetically modified seeds. I wanted to show different ways of, of doing uh, work. So you can be an activist, you can be a gardener, you can find different ways, but they're all gonna have challenges. It's gonna be hard work, whatever road you take. Wilson's latest work is a young reader book about Ella Deloria. What she did to preserve language and culture growing up in what had to be one of the most difficult times of, 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 of history for Dakota and Lakota people is she was born right after Wounded Knee and assimilation was you know happening so fast and yet she had that she had that vision. In Schaefer, Minnesota, Shirley Snavy, Indian Country Today. Thank you for watching. For all the latest news and updates, visit us anytime at IndianCountryToday.com. I'm Malia Chavez. Sometimes you got to take a stand just because you know you can. Oh, you got to run, you got to run. This is Indian Country Today.